And Lord, we're so thankful for your abounding grace in our lives, a grace that saves us, a grace that sustains and sanctifies us. And Lord, we're just so blessed, so thankful that we can come and spend these next few moments just continuing to worship you. Because Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time. Bless it, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask and all God's saints say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21. Uh, in chapter 20, Moses had dealt with the issue of warfare, dealing with battles, because in just a few short weeks, the children of Israel will be leaving the plains of Moab, crossing the Jordan, and entering into the promised land where they are to be sure to find plenty of battles. And we noticed in that section last time we were together that once we enter into the promised land or come to faith in Jesus Christ, that's when the enemy typically starts battling us. He comes at us, 1 Peter 5, 8, like that roaring lion. He's throwing those fiery darts, Ephesians 6, 16 declares. And that physical, that spiritual warfare then begins to happen, the battle. Now that battle while it is real, is ultimately the Lord's. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of these strongholds. And what a, a blessed truth that is. Well, as we come to chapter 21, Moses deals with a few different issues. Uh, there are five in all. And some of them might seem a little odd or a little strange, but these are some issues that the children of Israel are going to have to deal with when they get into the promised land. So let's take a look at the first issue that Moses deals with. There are five. Number one, the first issue involves finding the slain. Finding the slain. Finding somebody that has been killed. Uh, that's in verses 1 through 9. Take a look. In verse 1 of Deuteronomy 21, it says, If anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess, there in the promised land, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall go out, and they shall measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. And it shall be that the elders of the city nearest to the slain man will take a heifer which has not been worked and which is not pulled with a yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with flowing water, which is neither plowed nor sown. And they shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Then the priest, the sons of Levi, shall come near for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord. By their word, every controversy and every assault shall be settled. And all the elders of that city nearest the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. Then they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. Provide atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed. And do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people Israel. And, an, and atonement shall be provided on their behalf for the blood. So you shall put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. So finding someone who is slain. If that happens, the priests, who were Levites, were no doubt to make inquiry as to find out who the murderer really was. And if they couldn't do it, they then would take a heifer down to the valley where there was running water, break the neck of the heifer, wash their hands over the heifer as to say, we're innocent of the blood of this man that was slain because we have no idea who killed him. 
And then they would ask God to atone for the sins of the nation of Israel. In other words, the, the priest would say, God, we have no idea who killed this guy. So please don't bring the punishment of blood guilt upon the nation of Israel, upon the congregation as a whole. So the breaking of the neck of the heifer implied the guilt of the person who killed the person who, of course, is dead. Now, you say, well, Clark, why are you telling us all of this? Because it paints a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ, oh yes, because the heifer was innocent. The heifer did nothing. And yet the heifer had his neck broken. He died on behalf of the guilty person. Wow. Now you and I are born guilty. But Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was nailed to the cross in our stead. In fact, Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul said, Christ is our Passover who was sacrificed for us. In Titus 2, 14, he gave himself for us. Us. In 1 John 3, 16, he laid down his life for us. You get in the picture? He died in our stead. So this is really a beautiful picture of how we, in fact, are guilty. But Jesus Christ, who was innocent, died in our pray, pray, place. Interesting, in verse 9, they were crying out to God that they were innocent of this blood. Now, as I thought about that for a moment, that were, was the same words that the men used of Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? When God told Jonah, the son of Amittai, to go to Nineveh, that great city, the capital of Assyria. And Nineveh thought it would be better to head in the other direction. So he went down to Joppa jumped a ship to Tarshish, which presumably is in Spain. We're not sure. And you know the rest of the story. God sent a big storm. <laughs> All of the sailors were trying to figure out whose fault this storm was, so they drew lots. The lot fell to Jonah. And then Jonah finally acknowledged the fact that, well, yeah, this is all my fault. It's because I'm fleeing from the presence of the Lord. In fact, three times in chapter one, we're told he fled from the presence of the Lord. And since he drew the short stick, Jonah said, well, here's the answer to your problem, guys. If you would just throw me overboard, the storm would stop, everything would be fine. Well, the sailors thought about it for a half a second. <laughs> They chucked Jonah overboard, and in Jonah chapter 1, verse 14, they cried out to, to the Lord, Lord, we are innocent of this man's blood. You say, Clark, what's the point? I think the point here is very simple. We need to make sure we're innocent. We need to make sure we're not guilty. We need to make sure that whatever we do is always the right thing. And I got to tell you, living in this day and age, the pressure is to do the wrong thing. In fact, just today I was meeting with some of the attorneys going over this whole Winery County mess. And I'll tell you, some of the things they want us to do, it's like, oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Oh, you need to do this. You need to do No, we're not going to do that. That's what the world does. Oh, yeah. Wow. You're right. <laughs> now, we want to be different from the world. We want to make sure what we do is, is right before God, not right before men. And even though what they did was a bit weird or odd, they were crying out to the Lord for innocence of the blood of that man. So I think it's an interesting, interesting point. Well, uh, let's come to the second thing we want to look at. The first involved finding the slain. The second section deals with female 
captives. Female captives. That's in verses 10 through 14. Take a look. In verse 10, it says, When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and desire her, and would take her for your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house. She shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothes of her captivity, remain in your house, and mourn her father and her mother for a full month. After that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. Now, presumably, the women that are taken into captivity are outside the boundaries of the land of Canaan. Uh, because back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, God said to utterly destroy all the Canaanites, even the women. So apparently, this speaks of those who are outside the boundaries of the land of Canaan, we would um, uh, say. So if they go to war, they capture all the people, and if they see some uh, beautiful women there, and they, uh, you know, fall in love with them and want them to make them their wife. It's okay. They take them home. And the woman is to shave her head, um, maybe to see if he really likes her or not. I don't know. Um, and, uh, <laughs> trim her nails and change her clothes. Now, he's going, ooh. <laughs> Back to your land. No. Um, the, 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 sh the shaving of the head, the trimming of the nails, the changing of the clothes were all acts of mourning, we would say. It, it, it's an expression of grief and sorrow, no doubt, over the loss of her father and mother. Maybe they died in battle, or maybe she was taken captive and she won't see them again. Either way, it was a sign of mourning. But either way, the man was to wait 30 days before actually going into her because that was her time of grieving over the loss of her family members, if you will. But in verse 14, it says, And it shall be, if you have no delight in her, I mean, after you see her bald-headed, maybe, I don't know, <laughs> then, <laughs> then you shall set her free, but you shall certainly not sell her for money. You shall not treat her brutally because you have humbled her. You've went in and had physical relationship with her. Now, I'm not sure what constitutes uh, finding no delight in her. I'm assuming after 30 days, her hair is starting to grow back and she's changed her clothes and she's looking presentable again at this point. Uh, but, but, but the whole point here is very simple. That here, I believe we see God's heart toward women. God's heart toward women, even those taken in captivity. God wants to make sure the men of Israel place great value on the women, not seeing them sold into slavery, not abused, not mistreated. Now, I'd like you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3 for just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 3. Because I'm pretty sure that God's heart toward women haven't changed. I think today he still wants to see us place great value on our wives. Not selling them into slavery, not abusing them, not mistreating them. <laughs> and certainly not making them shave their head bald. Now, in 1 Peter chapter, seven, uh, chapter 3, in verse 7... Peter deals with this very issue. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them, speaking of your wives, with understanding, giving honor to your wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now notice in verse 7, it says, Likewise, you husbands. Uh, go back to chapter 2, verse 13 chapter 2, verse 13. It says, therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance. This speaks of submitting to authorities. I drop down to verse 18. Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters. Uh, look at chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be 
submissive to your own husbands. Now verse seven, chapter three, verse seven. Likewise, you husbands. Wow. The context deals with submission. Likewise, just like you're to submit to authorities, just like you're to submit to your masters, just like wives submit to their husbands, likewise, you husbands submit to your wives. Wow. Clark, are you sure that's what it means? Oh, yes. In fact, in Ephesians 5.21, the Bible says we are to submit one to another. Now, clearly, the husband is not to submit to the authority or the headship of the wife. Because Ephesians 5 is very clear. The husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. So he doesn't submit to her authority in a leadership role. You say, well, then what does he submit to? Well, he submits to her once her desires, he is submitting to how she is feeling. Now, I got to tell you, as men, this is not something that comes very natural to us. It becomes very difficult for us to actually submit to our wife's feelings. You know, I was speaking at a conference uh, one weekend and I came home and Sally said, wow, how was the conference? It was not at and you were there and, and so-and-so was there. I said, she, she said, so how was it? I said, it was good. <laughs> that was it. Well, what about this? And did you do this? Said, yeah. I wasn't really aware and submitting to her wants, her desires. And I think a lot of us probably fall very short in that area. I know I certainly do. Something will happen and there's this big thing. I'll say, you know what? It happened. It's over. It's done. Get over it. Let's move on. What's the big deal? Follow me. But you know, gals aren't really built that way. They want to talk about it for a few minutes. Okay, a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> and really, you know, just keep going over it and talking about it and getting it all off their chest and, you know, and, and really figuring it out and, and, you know, and it just makes them feel good and I don't get it. <laughs> I just don't get it. After the meeting today, well, you know, it was an hour and a half meeting. How'd the meeting go? It's okay. <laughs> now, clearly, clearly it deals with husbands submitting to how your wife feels, how she thinks, and what she wants. Now, if a husband is truly submitting in this manner, I think it's going to be seen or realized in three ways according to verse 7. Number one, it involves understanding. Notice, Peter said, dwell with them with understanding. Standing. The word understanding is the word gnosko. It means to know, to have knowledge, to perceive by experience. In other words, we are to be aware. We are to know what our wife is feeling and what they're going through. And we're to adjust our lives so that we're sensitive to it. And I got to tell you, this just does not come natural to a lot of guys. I know it doesn't for me. It's very, this is something I have to really be conscious of. Something I really have to be aware of. For instance, when I ask a question from the other room, I don't talk that soft, by the way, sometimes. I, I, you know, sometimes I can, because I can't hear. I, I'm deaf in this ear and I can't hear in that ear. So I have a tendency to kind of elevate my voice a little bit. And if Sally's in the other room, I might say something about, the laundry or about the kitchen or where's this or what about this and what happened to that? And she's going, what are you ranting and raving about? Ranting and raving? <laughs> this is ranting and raving? Wow, you should come out to the job sites with me a little bit. <laughs> well, that's ranting and raving. But, 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 we, but, but we come at things from such a different way, we might say, a different mindset. And it's important for us to have understanding to deal with them 
in an understanding way, knowing that we're different. Sally and I was, were uh, speaking at the Bible college uh, a week or so ago. We were at the marriage class, and uh, we were the, the guest speakers, and we came in, and we were just talking and sharing about marriage and, you know, and, and, and ministry and all of these things, and these kids' jaws were dropped like, wow. You guys are like real people. Yeah. <laughs> they, they had no idea. They thought, you know, something totally different. And they got an understanding that, yeah, we are different as men and women. Number two, the second thing involves honoring. Honoring. Look at verse 7 again. It says, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel. Now, the word honor that's used here is the word time. It's used 43 times in the New Testament. It means precious, worth a price. It's also translated valuable. Isn't that interesting? So Peter says that our wives are valuable because they are the weaker vessel. Now, some believe that he is talking about the physical aspect of the woman. So we as men are to watch over them, protect them, we're to make them feel safe and secure. And I think I understand that view, but I'm not so sure that's what he's talking about. I don't think he's talking about the physical, I think he's talking about the spiritual, because I know some gals that can whoop up on me pretty good, and I'm not proud of that fact. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I'm not sure it's dealing with the spiritual. I think it's dealing with the fact that God has given gals more sensitivity, how they're more gentle, more kind. Therefore, we are to regard them as more precious or more valuable. Very interesting. And the third thing that's involved in submitting to our wife's needs and wants involves praying, praying. At the end of verse 7, it says that your prayers may not be hindered. Wow. Why should we submit to our wives? Why should we understand them? Why should we give honor to them? So our prayers aren't hindered. Look, if our relationship with our wife isn't right, our relationship with God isn't going to be right either. And I think this is pretty important because I fear oftentimes that we as couples have a tendency to say, well, you know, I, I would love her more if she submitted to me. Well, I would submit to him if he loved me the way Christ loved the church. You know, he's such a knucklehead. But you know, the truth of the matter is what we're supposed to do is not dependent upon what our spouse is supposed to do. We need to do what we're supposed to do in, in spite of what they do or don't do. And I think this is an important issue. Why? Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 7, that the woman is the glory of the man. Wow. Amen. The woman is the glory of the man. In other words, guys, your wife is a reflection of you. I had shared at the Bible college with all of the couples there the other day that Sally was absolutely perfect. <laughs> okay, you just got that, fine. <laughs> but truly, guys, if your wife is messed up, it's your fault. <laughs> and all the women say, okay. <laughs> Back to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Let's come to the third issue. We said there were, I don't even know how many there are. Number three. We've, we've looked at finding the slain, female captives. Number three. The third thing deals with the firstborn's inheritance. The firstborn's inheritance. That's in verses 15 through 17, take a look in Deuteronomy 21, verse 15. It says, if a man has two wives, he needs to have his head, ex oh no, it says, <laughs> it doesn't say that. It probably should, but it, 
It says, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, and if the firstborn son of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day he bequeaths his possessions to his sons, when he's going to pass down his inheritance, that he must not bestow firstborn status on the son of the loved wife in preference to the son of the unloved who is truly the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Now, clearly, God's not dealing with polygamy here. He's certainly not condoning it. He's simply mentioning it that it's something that already happens, uh, much like slavery in Leviticus chapter 25. And we know, of course, that God's uh, original plan for marriage was one man and one woman in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 24. But here, he is dealing with the firstborn's inheritance. And I think the application here for us is very simple. I think we need to be very careful in dealing with issues and circumstances in our life not to let love or emotion dictate our decisions. Our decisions need to be based on the Word of God, based on what is right and, not, and, and what is wrong. Not based on our love for somebody or our less love for others or how we think or what we feel or the certain emotions that we have. No, we always need to do what is right in spite of our emotions or what we think or what we feel. Well, uh, let's come to the fourth area and that involves failure to obey. Failure to obey. Now look at verses 18 through 21. In verse 18, it says, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when, he, uh, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of, this, of his city. That's the place of judgment. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey my voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. I like that verse. I think at one point we had it on a refrigerator. <laughs> now here obviously the penalty for going against your parents is death. Now the problem here is that son broke the fifth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. And by the way, it's the only commandment given with a promise. The promise is to honor your mother and father. For by doing so, your days will be long on the earth. Now, conversely, if you do not obey and honor your father and mother, well, your days aren't going to be very long at all because they're going to take you out and stone you to death. <laughs> now, <laughs> you... you, you in fact, growing up, you might have even heard your mother say, I have brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> it's biblical. <laughs> now, <laughs> now the, <laughs> the punishment for this crime was twofold. The punishment for this crime involved two reasons, uh, according to verse 21. The first reason is to put away evil. Look at verse 21 again. In the middle of the verse, it says, So you shall put away the evil person from among you. Get rid of that which is evil. Boy, what a good word for us. Get rid of the evil in our lives. Now, I am certainly not advocating we take our children out and stone them, though I have thought about it on occasion. 
No, the point for us is dealing with our lives personally, individually. Man, we need to be very careful to purge out that evil. A lot of people today say, well, it's just a little bit. It's really not hurting anybody. Oh, really? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the leaven from amongst you that you may become a new lump. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that evil company corrupts good morals or good habits. Look, you and I are to be different. We're to be set apart from the world. And a little bit of sin is not okay. So the first reason for the punishment is to put away evil. The second reason is to bring about fear. Look at the end of verse 21. It says, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Interesting. Now, I don't read anywhere in the Bible where children have been stoned to death. So apparently this works pretty good. <laughs> Follow me? It was to strike fear into the hearts of of other children. I mean, can you imagine seeing one of your schoolmates taken out to the city gates? Hey, where's he going? Oh, you're going to see, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, I think the reason this is important for us is because oftentimes our children don't fully appreciate the consequences of their actions because we don't issue consequences to their actions. We let things slide. We let them get away with quite a bit. Now, I'm not saying we lay a heavy hand on them and, and, and be overbearing, and, but there's a balance in this. You know, I was speaking at a church, and uh, before service, I was in the foyer, and I saw a couple of kids. They were just tearing the place up, and I thought, wow. I, I looked to the gal standing next to me, and there's a couple of kids that need a spanking. We don't spank our kids. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. I mean... <laughs> Look, e even God disciplines us. Why? Well, because he loves us. Read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. The Bible says that the Lord chastens those that he loves. Well, number four and finally, real quickly. Uh, the fourth and final section involves fouling the land. Fouling the land. Causing the land to be foul or defiled. Look at verses 22 and 23. In verse 22, it says, if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile, pollute, or foul the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now, of course, in ancient times, hanging somebody on a tree, nailing them to the tree, was not only done to kill them as punishment for a crime, but it was also to send a message to others who might be thinking about committing that crime. But here, God says, leaving them hanging on that tree overnight is something that shouldn't be done. It defiles, pollutes, fouls the land. And that is exactly why in John chapter 19, verse 31, that the Jews asked for Jesus' body be, to be taken down off the tree where he was hung that very same day as not to defile the land. Now, it is interesting at the end of verse 23, it says whoever's hanged on a tree is cursed of God. He is accursed. You say, wait a minute. In Acts 10, 39, the Bible says Jesus hung on a tree. Are you telling me he is a curse of God? Oh, yes, absolutely. Why? Because when Jesus was nailed to the cross, when he was hung on the tree, he took the sins of all mankind upon himself. He literally, listen class, he literally became the embodiment of, of sin. 1 Peter 2.24 says he bore our sins in his own body. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says he who knew no sin became sin for us. So Jesus Christ took the sins of the world upon himself. Therefore he was accursed of God. 
He was separated from God for that momentary period of time as he took on our sins. Because we were born under the curse, under the law. And that's exactly why Paul said in Galatians 3.13 that Christ has redeemed us out from under the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Wow, this is the verse that really blesses my heart because Jesus took my curse upon himself. He redeemed me. He purchased me out from under the curse of the law by taking my sin and thus forgiving me of my sin so that I would have that right relationship with God. And here we see <laughs> Jesus Christ fulfilling this very portion of Scripture. Father, it is just amazing. As we go through your word, Lord, how rich it is. Lord, how practical it is. And Lord, we do pray that by your spirit, you would continue to let your word sink deep into our hearts. Lord, that our lives would be transformed. Lord, that we would truly purge out that which is unpleasing to you, that we would be consecrated, set apart for you all the days of our life. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Fill us with your spirit that our life would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you are here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, after service, the pastors, the brothers, the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to minister to your hearts, whatever the need may be. And I do pray that God would continue to to bless you and strengthen you, encourage you as you simply fall more in love with him. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, a great rest of the week in the Lord. <laughs>